you so very much for joining us here today at Church on the Rock. We're so excited to have you, and we pray that God has a very specific word for you today. If you haven't checked out our website, let me urge you to go to JesusIsTheRock.org. There you can find all of our latest news, blog posts, and messages. Also, while you're there, you can very easily give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the very top right-hand corner of the screen of any web page. Thank you again for joining us today, and let us prepare ourselves to hear from God. Tonight, we are uh, we're continuing with our look at some Old Testament heroes, and uh, last week, we started uh, talking about David. I told you we were going to take a few weeks on David. Normally, we've been just kind of going one week and one person at a time, but David takes a little more time. And last week, we talked about David as a shepherd boy and uh, what it takes to be a man after God's own heart. Tonight, we're going to move into his kingship, and um, we'll be out next week. And whenever we get back together, then I'll um, be going on and talking about kind of late in his kingship and as he exits that. And, um, and by no way will we exhaust everything there is to say about David. It would take probably a, a year of Wednesday nights to do that. Uh, but we'll just kind of hit some highlights. But tonight um, tonight will be a little bit different. We're going to kind of illustrate a few things for you. Uh, with some some pictures and things that may seem a little bit more like a play or production in some ways. But we, we're doing that not just for entertainment-wise, but to try and help you maybe get a, a word picture and get an image of some things we're talking about. Because the purpose of the message tonight is simple and straightforward. I have really just one purpose, one hope, and one prayer is that you'll leave here tonight with a greater love, a greater passion and a greater appreciation for God's mercy and for God's grace. Uh, if that happens, then I will have done my job. John, see if you can turn me down just a little bit. I'm just, it's a little bit hot. Thanks. Um, I think it must really just break the heart of God today when we so flippantly and carelessly take for granted His grace and His mercy almost as if it's something we have earned or something we deserve. You know, God, yeah, we, we sort of deserve mercy. We deserve grace. After all, we're good Christians and we go to church and we pray and we do all this. So, you know, and I hope we leave here tonight with a better understanding of the great price, the great price that was paid for our mercy, for our grace. Um, and that we, we would not take it for granted. And I want us to understand a little bit of what it was like to live without grace, and without mercy, because there was a time when grace and mercy wasn't here like it is today. Some of you can appreciate this. Some of you older folks, you can appreciate it in that you can remember what life was like without indoor plumbing. When if you wanted to go to the bathroom, you had to go outside and across the yard and no matter how cold or whatever and go to an outhouse somewhere to use the facilities. Whereas now you just go to a room in the house or you can remember what it was like to live in a house with no electricity where you didn't just flip a switch and have lights, but maybe you had a lantern or something that you had to light to give any kind of light at all in the house. And now, you know, we just take for granted. We've got our restrooms and we've got our lights. I remember going to Jamaica one time and we were uh, doing some projects over there. And one of the things we were doing, we were out in the bush and all of the, they had schools over there with elementary kids and and in this school, they didn't have lights. They had no electricity. They had windows, and, and they used the sunlight, and that was all the light that they had. And these kids, where they lived up in the mountains, they didn't have electricity. So most of these kids had never seen lights. They didn't know what electricity was. They had never had that. And we were running power out to the school and installing lights, and we worked there for several days doing that. But I'll never forget the grand finale when we went into the school 
and all the kids were there, and we got all of their attention, and we flipped the switch, and the lights come on. They didn't know what we were doing, but all of a sudden, for the first time in many of their lives, they saw lights, and they just screamed and jumped up, you know, and they were just going crazy and running around because they had never seen that, and that was so foreign to us because we've seen lights all of our life. You know, and so that's kind of the the thing that I want you to understand is that there was a time when you just didn't go ask for forgiveness for your sins. It just wasn't done. And uh, to help us understand this time, we're going to look at this scenario through the eyes of a great king named David. Personally, I don't think there is another Bible character as qualified as David to teach us about God's mercy and the lack of it or the appreciation for it. David, as we said last week, was called a man after God's own heart. A man after God's own heart. He, he said things like, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I mean, he, he, he had a relationship with God. He said, As the deer pants after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. He said, Lord, I need you more than I need my food and my drink. I mean, which one of us have have got to that place where we said, God, I need you more than I need my food, more than I need drink, more than I need my stuff. I need you. You can take my food, take my drink, but don't take your Holy Spirit from me, he said one time. From a shepherd boy to a king, he was both a worshiper and a warrior. David would sit on Monday and play his harp and write poetry and all of these things. You can read through the Psalms and see all the things he wrote and all the songs that he wrote and as he played them out and then get up on Tuesday morning, pick up a sword and go out and kill a thousand men. He was just that well-rounded, anointed person. He, He took a rock and a rag and killed a giant. He killed a bear and a lion with his bare hands. And David's going to teach us how to love mercy and how to appreciate grace. If you have your Bibles and you want to read with us, I'm going to read the 85th Psalm tonight. The 85th Psalm. John just shared with us out of Psalm uh, 100, I think, and and talked about David um, magnifying and glorifying God. But I want you to listen in Psalm 85. David writes... It says, Lord, you've poured out amazing blessings on your land. You've restored the fortunes of Israel. You've forgiven the guilt of your people. Yes, you've covered all their sins. You have withdrawn your fury. You've ended your blazing anger. That's in the past. He says, now turn to us again. O God of our salvation, will you be angry with us always? Will you prolong your wrath to distant generations? Won't you revive us again so your people can rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I listen carefully to what God the Lord is saying. Now he's listening. For he speaks peace to his people, his faithful ones. But let them not return to their foolish ways. Surely his salvation is near to those who honor him. Our land will be filled with his glory. So he begins to speak prophetically now about what's coming to pass. He says, mercy and truth. Listen, mercy and truth, two different things. Mercy and grace and the law. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That's awesome. I love this language. Truth springs up from the earth and righteousness smiles down from heaven. Yes, the Lord pours down his blessings. Our land will yield its bountiful crops. Righteousness goes as a herald before him, preparing the way for his steps. So I want to use for a text this morning, verse number 10, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. And the title of the message tonight is The Day Truth Met Mercy. The Day Truth Met Mercy. 
So in our text, David speaks of a day when mercy meets truth, righteousness and peace kiss each other. And of course, all of this is beautiful, symbolic, poetic language. And I think a man like David is really the only person that could adequately relay this to us. And keep in mind, at the time of this writing, this hasn't happened. Truth hasn't met mercy. Righteousness and peace has not kissed each other. It would all come later. David's speaking prophetically now about a day that was to come. In my opinion, I think David was, was a man born before his time. I mean, he, he, he was obsessed with the idea of mercy, with grace, maybe more than any man who ever lived, and, and for good reason, because David was really the first human being to ever experience God's grace like we have it today. We take it for granted, but it was, it was sort of like if David had, had walked into his little hut, whatever they lived in, and, and everybody else was lighting lanterns and lighting candles and all this stuff, and David just went in and flipped on the switch, went in the bathroom and used the restroom. You know, it was like he had something that we have today, and he was the only one that ever experienced, and he only experienced it for this long of time. One event in his life, one total moral failure, one meltdown, one sin, and he goes to God and he repents and he cries out. He bypasses the law. He bypasses the high priest. He bypasses the temple. He bypasses the sacrifices and he grabs hold of the heartstrings of God and says, according to thy multitude of tender mercies, have mercy on me. And God did. It's the only time we have record of in the Old Testament that God ever just forgave sins with somebody just asking. So David, he reached out of the Old Testament into the New Testament, and he got a taste of mercy, and it tasted so good, it just wet his appetite. David had gotten a glimpse of something so unbelievable, he had to have more. I mean, it was like crack cocaine. You know, they say you could do crack cocaine one time and be addicted. That you, you know, you have to have more. And that's the way it was with David. All right, when and where David lived, the only mercy that existed rested on top of a box called the Ark of the Covenant. Well, you've seen, if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark or it was, a, it, was a, it was a box, a gold box. It was encased in 700 pounds of pure gold. 700 pounds. How much is gold an ounce these days? 700 pounds of pure gold. It had on the top of it two cherubims or angels with their wings facing each other. Now, what you don't see on this box that was on the original ark was in between these two cherubims or angels with their wings, there was a seat. It was called the mercy seat. And even though no one physically sat in there, it was a place where God dwelt. And there was a seat there that the, the high priest would once a year go in and they would sacrifice animals on the Ark of the Covenant and the blood would flow on it. And, and if God accepted the sacrifices, then the people's sins would be forgiven. But it was all a gory and hard and difficult process. They had to bring their sacrifices to temple and, and the high priest would go in. And, if, and if, it was, if, if they were unworthy, then the high priest would drop dead behind the temple veil. In fact, they tied a rope to his leg. So if, if, if they, and they had bells on his garments, and if the bells quit ringing, they knew he was dead, and they would pull him out because nobody else could go behind the temple veil. And, and so it was, this, it was this gory process and difficult. There, there was just no asking for forgiveness. You didn't just go out and sin and say, God, forgive me, and it was done. It was a big deal. And uh, there's a story too long to really go into, uh, but it's, it's the Israelites the Ark of the Covenant, when it would go into a room, there was no need for lights because the presence of God, the Bible calls it the Shekinah glory of God, and, and it would light up the darkest room because the, the Spirit of God rested on the Ark. That was where God dwelt in the earth at that time. 
Today, we have the Holy Spirit that dwells among men. The Holy Spirit wasn't given in that day. Remember when Jesus said, I'm going away, but if I go away, I'm going to send another comforter? Well, that's when the Holy Spirit came to earth. Before then, there was no Holy Spirit, but God rested on the ark, on the ark. So just the glory of God would light up the darkest room. Well, they had an idea one time. Hey, since God is here, let's take the Ark of the Covenant out from the temple veil and let's take it out on the battlefield with us. So when we go out on the battlefield, we'll win the battle because God will be with us. Well, that wasn't God's plan, and that's not what happened. In fact, when they went out to battle, they got defeated horribly. And, and the Philistines actually stole, took the Ark of the Covenant and took it back with them. I mean, 700 pounds of gold. And they set it in a room with all of their other gods, their gods of wood and their gods of stone and their gods and all, all these different gods. Well, before long, because it was where God lived in the presence of God and the presence of God was so strong, their gods began to crumble. Gods of stone crumbled. Gods of wood fell over face first. They began, and so the Israelite, uh, the Philistines finally said, you know what? Get this thing out of here. We don't want it. I mean, I don't know what it is. I don't know what's happening, but all of our gods, just get it out of here. And so they sent word, come get it, and, and they made a half-hearted attempt to go get it. They built a cart, and they went down, and they they. They set the Ark of the Covenant on the cart. There was, a, there was a law. Nobody is to touch the Ark. You don't touch the Ark of the Covenant, period. So they, they got it on this cart, and they're rolling it back, going to take it back to Jerusalem. Well, they go down. The, the cart hits a pothole, and the thing starts to fall off. So one of the guys, he don't want the Ark of the Covenant falling off. He reaches up to steady it. He drops dead because that's the law. You don't touch the ark. There's no mercy. There's no grace. That's the law. You're dead. Even though I'm trying to do a good thing, doesn't matter what you're trying to do. The law said don't touch it. It's just that simple. And so they get kind of scared and freaked out. You know what? I mean, this thing. So they leave it at the house of Obed-Edom. He's this guy between Jerusalem and where they were fighting. They leave it at his house. You know what? Put it here. Well, the Bible goes on to say, just a little side note, so while it was there, everything in Obed-Edom's house prospered. I mean, this guy hit the lottery. You know, I don't know why, but he just says he prayed everything in his house prospered, all of this stuff, while the ark is sitting at his house. Well, enter David. David thinks about this ark. He thinks about that's where the mercy seat is. Have mercy on me, Lord, according to thy multitude of tender mercies. That's the mercy seat. He thinks about how when sin hits the mercy seat, it disappears. And David decides it's time to get the mercy seat back into Jerusalem. It's time to get that thing back here. He wants it right out in the open where everybody can go and receive mercy. Maybe, maybe he'll get his architects to build a grandstand in the middle of town square where people can just go and pray to God at the mercy seat and their sins will be forgiven. He wanted what we have today. He wanted it desperately. He wanted it. He had tasted it. He had seen just a glimpse of it. Now he wanted it for everybody. We take it for granted. But David, the visionary, looked ahead in time, and he saw this, and he saw it, and he said, this is what we want. So he goes to the priest, and he says, how can we get the ark back here, you know, without killing everybody? How, how do we get the thing back here? So they explained to him that the ark was never meant to be carried on a cart, it had little rings in the top of it, and it had poles slid through it, and it was meant to be carried on the shoulder of the priest, one on each corner. They would carry it. That's how the ark is to be transported, not on a cart. So David says, hey, strike up the band. I mean, let's go get it. Let's roll. He gathers the priest together, and he heads off to the house of Obed-Edom. He's going to get the mercy seat. He's going to get the ark and bring it back. And David and his entourage, they go and they retrieve the ark and they head back into Jerusalem. And when they head back into Jerusalem, strike up the band. I mean, they began to party. They had a parade going on back into Jerusalem that would make our Mardi Gras parades look like a funeral procession. 
I mean, they were, the Bible says David danced before the Lord with all his might. They were singing and they were dancing and they were rejoicing because this is the happiest day of David's life. Mercy is coming back to Jerusalem. We're going we're gonna to put it here and people can go. And have, This is what he dreamed of once and for all. The mercy seat would be out here. And he dances into Jerusalem. Hold on. Let me get the grandstand ready. Let's, let's get it in here. This is it. And, and, and the priests say, hold on, David. It can't go there. You see, the ark has got to go back behind the temple veil. Back to its rightful place. Back behind the curtain. We have our picture. The temple veil was about six inches thick, a curtain, literal curtain, about six inches thick, and it had no opening. It was just solid. And the Ark of the Covenant sat behind there, and the priests say, the, the ark has got to go back behind the veil. And David says, no, no, it's got to be out here where we can receive mercy, where we can touch it. And, and they just push David to the side, king and all. And they take the ark of the covenant back behind the temple veil. And David stands there and he watches it go behind the curtain. And that's the last time that David would ever see it. I wonder if that's not the day that David may have sat down and penned these words. I don't know. But in verse 5, he says, Will you be angry with us always? Will you prolong your wrath to distant generations? Won't you revive us again so your people can rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O oh Lord, and grant us your salvation. God, I've tasted it before, and I just want it again. I just want to taste it again. I want it where everybody can receive this. Truth. Truth. The law. Righteousness has been here all the time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God has been here forever, and God is truth. Let all men be liars, but let God be truth. Truth has been here since the beginning of time. The problem was when the law was transgressed, or the law was broken, when sin happened, there was no mercy to intervene. You touch the box, you die. Doesn't matter your intentions. Because mercy's locked behind the temple veil. Mercy can't get out. Judgment was swift and sure, and life was brutal. The earth had been known to open up and swallow entire cities. It's recorded in Scripture. The ground would open up and swallow a city because of sin in the camp, sin in the city. Remember Achan? Achan was a soldier, and they went in and they took a city one time, and God said, don't keep anything, but destroy everything in the city. But Achan saw this really cool coat, and he says, you know, it's just a coat. And he took it, but he couldn't even enjoy it because that's how sin is. He said, I can't wear the thing. because So he hid it under his tent. I got to have it, though. I got to keep it. And he hid it under his tent, and they began to have problems, and they began to have trouble. And Joshua went to the Lord and said, what, what's going on here? Why are we? And, and God said, there's sin in the camp. Get it out. Deal with it. And he revealed to him that Achan had stolen this coat. What's the penalty? Death. You broke the law. Not just death for Achan, but Achan and his whole family is thrown in a pit and stoned to death because he took a coat. Can you imagine a father has to sit there with his little boy and say, son, it's not you, it's me. I'm the reason they're throwing rocks at us. It's a law. That's, that's what it was. Mercy wanted to intervene, but she couldn't. There was no mercy. Mercy's behind the temple veil. That was truth. That was righteousness. 
Mercy sits behind the veil, crying to get out. She wants to intervene, but the temple veil has no door. One day, Mercy hears that truth is being manifested over in Bethlehem. Truth is coming to earth. And she thinks maybe this is it. This is it. Truth is coming. Truth is my lover. Truth is truth is, is, is what I want to be joined together with. I want to intervene to truth. But not yet. Not yet. She still can't get out. Twelve years pass. And Mercy hears truth saying, I must be about my father's business. And she must think, this is it. This is it, finally. Finally, I'll go and I'll be joined together with truth. But it doesn't happen. Eighteen years pass. Mercy hears that truth is being baptized over in the Jordan River. And, and, and the voice out of heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And Mercy says, this is it. This is it. But it's not. Three more years pass. Mercy's cringing to get out. Three years later, truth is drugged through the streets. Beaten. Bloody. And bruised. Truth is dragged up Calvary's hill. Mercy screams to get out. She longs to go to him. She wants to intervene because she's mercy. Can you imagine mercy seeing Christ, truth, drug up a hill, beaten, whipped? She's mercy. She wants to intervene. But the veil, she can't get through the veil. Truth cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How that must make mercy cringe. Let me go to my lover. But she can't get out. And the sky turns dark and the thunder rolls in the background. Maybe they'll never meet. Maybe this is the end. Maybe it's all over. When out of the darkness, truth lifts his head. And with parched lips and a blood-soaked voice, he whispers, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It is finished. And when he said, it's finished, something happened in the temple veil began to rip. The Bible said it ripped from top to bottom. It tore in two. And suddenly she looked out and she saw what? Calvary. Calvary. Again, thank you so very much for joining us here today at Church on the Rock. I pray that our message has impacted you in a positive way. If you would like to share how our ministries are impacting you, you have a specific prayer request, or maybe you want more information about our church or how to get involved in our ministries, you can easily email us at pray at jesusistherock.org, or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter at Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. Have a very blessed day. God raise up a